So we'll start with our first concept, which is the idea of a policy. And we're going to denote a policy with the Greek letter pi, right? So we're going to say it's going to map from a state to an action. So this is actually very close to our supervised learning paradigm, right? We can think of states as individual instances in our data matrix. So I have state uh, one here, you know, state two here. And this just basically gives some configuration of the environment, right? And for each of these states, I want to learn a particular action that I'm going to take, A1 or A2. So if I happen to be in state S2, then I know I'm going to take action A2, right? And so you can think of this as a, just this type of mapping, our supervised learning problem mapping, where we want to say, um, given that I'm in a certain state, say S2 here, okay, over here, all right, then I'm going to uh, look through my mapping function and determine which action I'm going to take. And so this could be deterministic, but it could also be stochastic, right? I could say, you know, I uh, am in a particular state and I'm going to take an action with a certain amount of probability, right? So uh, being in a particular state here, you know, S uh, being a, a generic variable for any one of these states, right? It could be whichever one it selects, all right, uh, at a particular time step. Then I'm going to go to do a particular action with some probability from all the actions that are possible at that time step. Another key important concept is the idea of a value function, right? So the value function is interesting because it's basically a prediction about the future reward of uh, being in a certain state or taking a certain action, right? So you can say it's um, used to evaluate the goodness or uh, badness of a state. So you can see how this is going to affect the policy, right? So what we want to do is uh, select a, a particular state that's going to give more relative goodness than another uh, state that might be performing a little bit suboptimally, right? So we're going to use this value function to assess um, the relative value of states, and that's going to help us select what type of action to take. And it's going to have a particular formalism, right? We can say that the value function needs to be a function of a particular policy, like if we take certain actions, given certain states, we might end up with different values that we place upon uh, a particular state. So uh, again, since it's a prediction of future reward, what we can do is we can say, well, you know, what's my expected amount of reward for the policy that I have now? Well, I can say, well, uh, given that I'm going to take a certain action, I'm going to end up in a new state, that uh, new state has some reward. Right, and then at that time step t plus one, I'm going to execute another action. And that new action is going to produce a new state. That new state is going to get another reward t2. And that t2, I'm going to recurse and do the same thing. So I'm going to go through all of these sequences, uh, given the fact that I'm in a particular state right now at time t. Okay, so it's going to be a sum total of all of these expected rewards. But because we have this idea of a future reward, we might want to say that, you know, uh, rewards farther and farther into the future will have some type of uh, parameter, gamma, that's going to discount it, right? We're going to say that, okay, uh, the immediate reward that we have is uh, somehow better. So we're going to formalize this in a short while. Another piece of the puzzle that we have is the idea of a model, right? So the model is basically something that's going to help us predict what the environment is going to uh, react and do with us next, right? So if I have a model of the world, like say, I pick up an object as a person, I know if I drop it, uh, I have a prediction about how the world is going to react. Gravity is going to take over and that object will fall to the ground. It might shatter, it might damage something, etc. So that is in the case where the agent itself has some type of uh, predictive power of what's going to happen next. And we can model that as a transition matrix, okay? 
this uh, large uh, uh, script P the variable that I have here, which is going to predict the next state. So even if I have a very large data matrix, again, you know, our uh, X is here and each of the rows in X is a particular state, what I am going to have is this matrix P, which is going to say, you know, well, I'm in a particular state right now, okay? If I'm in this particular state and I can take one of uh, several actions here, which of the following states am I going to end up next? You know, maybe I'll end up in state 172 or uh, 255 or something like that, okay? So basically, this transition probability matrix is then saying, um, for a particular action that's valid at this time step, uh, being in this state, uh, what's the probability of ending up in uh, a new state uh, at t plus one, okay, and whatever state that is, maybe uh, s prime, right? So we're just indexing it as, uh, from this state s to the state s prime, and then think of that as a probability value. So of course, as a probability, we would have to sum over all the possible actions that would allow us to end up at uh, any number of different states, right? And so uh, taking the sum total of all of the uh, probabilities for this row, it would have to sum to one, okay? And the model that's for predicting the next state, we might also have a model of rewards. So we'll say script R is basically predicting the next immediate rewards that we would have at a certain time step. So here it would be the expectation of what rewards we would get at the next time step, given that I'm in state S and I execute a particular action A. Okay, so we're going to indicate that as the script R here uh, being in a particular state, not at a particular time step, but uh, being in a particular state, all right, and taking a particular action, right? So even if I'm at a uh, particular act, uh, state here, I might have different actions I can take, um, uh, you know, A1, A2, A3, A4, and then the tuple between the state and the action, right? Any one of these four actions will describe uh, what type of outcome I expect to get at the next time step in terms of an immediate reward. So let's try to concretize it a little bit. So we're looking at this grid world maze that we have here. So the objective is uh, similar to ones uh, in the uh, case of the laboratory rat where we start off at a particular location, let's say the starting location here. And our goal is to get to the checkered flag in the bottom, right? And we can say, you know, um, because we want to do this in the shortest possible, every time uh, you do an action, it has a cost, okay? So even though we're thinking of rewards, we'll just uh, cast them as negative to encourage the agent to uh, get to the goal as fast as possible. So a thought question for all of you uh, looking through the video, what happens if I don't institute a negative reward per time step, okay? Now, with that, I have a sequence of actions um, that are available. Of course, these could be changed at any one time, you know, pretending on the state. Uh, so at any particular state, I might say, you know, you have the possibility of going north, uh, going east, going south, or going west. And then the states would be basically any state in the grid, uh, basically a location in this in which some of these locations, let's say, uh, for example, being here, um, make certain actions disallowed, right? So even though uh, in some general cases, I can go north, east, south, and west, the only viable uh, action at this point is to go east and stay and not bump into any of the blue walls here. So that's the setup of the grid world. Let's, let's take a look at the policy, right? If I have a policy, that means for each viable state, which are all the white squares here, then I have to decide how I'm going to map that state into an action, right? So even though I have in certain locations more than one action, I have to formalize what I'm going to do. So in a case of a deterministic policy, we might have something like what the arrows indicate here, meaning, for example, if I'm at this uh, particular point here, I might decide um, that this hash table, my policy tells me that I'm going south, going down one. Uh, if I had a, a 
a probabilistic policy, then maybe uh, you know I could go up, down, uh, or uh, to the to the right uh, to go east uh, with some probability. So how about the value function? Then the value function basically represents the value for being in a particular state, right? So this is most clear when we're very close to the goal. So for example, here, uh, we know within one time step that I can have a, a good value here, I would get to the goal. And uh, assuming the goal has no particular value, then I would say this is the best value um, in, in the state because at this point, I know I'm one step away from finishing the task and uh, I have a score of negative one here, right? So I can propagate this value function backwards through all of the states to calculate uh, how far distant I am and uh, assign an appropriate value function for that state. So how about the grid world model? So the model is again, uh, some type of representation that the agent has about the environment, right? About how the actions uh, change the state of the environment so uh, going up and down, left and right, might take you to a new state. So we might be able to represent that state as a grid, um, a data structure in the, the mind of the agent, okay, in the data structure of the agent. Um, and then what rewards that we get for uh, going in each individual state. So for example, in, in this model that we have on the left here, it's just a representation of the immediate reward that we might be trying to encode uh, as the state information, right? Uh, so um, uh, given that uh, taking a certain time step, uh, taking an action to go left, right, uh, or up or down, uh, we have to incur a cost because there's a time step, right? So that cost might be negative one, so this represents the immediate reward reward, and that would be the same for uh, any uh, particular square here. Now, uh, many times the uh, model is not perfect, so uh, even our estimates might be a little bit off here. So for example, um, here we might think uh, for whatever reason that it takes a little bit longer uh, to traverse the square, so it might have a, a higher cost. Okay, so in terms of our grid world, we could say that our grid representation layout um, represents the transition model, right? So we might think, okay, it looks pretty deterministic. We, we know from, uh, say, going from this state uh, to this state means we go to the to um, east one, for example. And uh, as I've already explained, the numbers here that would just uh, represent the immediate rewards. For example, going from uh, this state to this state requires one time step, so we can incur the cost of one. So our uh, immediate reward is a negative number. Okay, then since we have talked about all three of these components, it's uh, a good time to consolidate this information into some type of taxonomy. So we can say, you know, there's the component of a value function and there's the component of a policy. And uh, in fact, uh, you can have agents that uh, don't actually have a policy that are just value-based that look at either the actions values or the state's value and try to decide uh, based on some comparative uh, evaluation which uh, state or action is better to take. So we are going to call these value-based uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. There's also the case that you might uh, actually just develop a policy, right? Um, don't need to uh, decide uh, which states are better for you or which actions are better for you, but just to know that if you're in this particular state, you should do a particular action. So uh, you can think of this as some type of rule book and we're gonna call this a policy-based uh, method. There's also the possibility that you have both, right? So you can have an actor critic formalism which adopts both a, a, a value function as well as a policy, okay? And then completely independent of these decisions is the idea of whether you need to incorporate a model or not. So you can have uh, model-free uh, reinforcement learning algorithms that don't try to model the environment and ones that do. 
So I hope you understand all of these uh, five quadrants that we have here in terms of the bread uh, specification of an RL agent and uh, the three different types of components. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list of components, just uh, typical ones that you'll see in the case of uh, reinforcement learning. So let's stop and pause for a second and try to bring it up a level. Okay, so even though we're talking about reinforcement learning uh, in this particular lecture, there's actually two different strands of thoughts when it comes to sequential decision making. We can think of the idea of reinforcement learning, which is what we're learning here. Where we're basically saying, you know, at the beginning, we have no idea what's going on in the environment. The agent is sort of just like uh, catapulted into the environment and has to make do has to interact with the environment, figure out what actions are uh, feasible or valid, which ones are not, and then over time uh, be able to uh, improve its policy and uh, get value out of being in the environment. So you can think of the reinforcement learning agent as playing around with the environment to figure out the rules of the game and then figure out how to increase its reward. On the other hand, uh, many uh, different disciplines also look at this idea of planning, like in economics, where uh, we might try to really get a good model understanding of the environment. And so we might be able to exactly incorporate all the rules of the environment. And then basically we would run a simulator, right? So without any type of interaction, uh, we would decide uh, simulating it in the agent's mind, running in the model of the environment, um, coming up with an idea of how the re environment would actually react to doing certain types of actions, right? And then faithfully playing this out over multiple time steps, we can get an idea of what we should be doing. So this is the idea of planning, right? So we improve the policy by thinking of uh, you know, all of these what if statements. You know, what if I did this? What, if, what types of consequence would it lead to? Would that be better or worse for me in the long run, right? So um, if you've taken fundamentals of AI, foundations of AI, you've heard of A star search. This is an idea of the idea of planning, right? Going through the search space uh, and then trying to figure out uh, which is the appropriate action to take. And so this is very different uh, from the learning perspective where we're doing reinforcement learning. So this is a case where AI and uh, machine learning uh, are markedly different types of things. So it helps to reinforce this concept, right? Pun intended. So let's take a look at a game example, right? So if we're thinking of it from a reinforcement paradigm, it's actually pretty interesting, right? You can think of the idea is that you've bought a new game cartridge and you don't want to look, look at the instructions, you just sit down and try to play the game, right? So the rules of the game are unknown. Um, there's just a controller that you can interact with. And um, the way that you're going to uh, get more score is just try, right? So you just try, um, you play by uh, filling with the controller, uh, making an action, right? And then uh, the environment, um, the, the system itself, is going to generate two pieces of information. Um, what's the score, our uh, immediate reward? So this could be a delta and a score, as well as the observation. So this is our uh, observable uh, gains uh, space. And then based on that, uh, we're going to pick uh, new actions to go through at, at the next time step, OK? On the other hand, we can think of planning, right? So planning is the case where all the rules of the game are known, right? So for example, I do buy the game, but I bother to look at the instruction manual. I say, okay, I have a number of ships. I know exactly I can go right or left. I can go up or down. I can shoot or, or, or do something else, right? So in this type of case, then I have all the ideas about what can be done, what how the environment will react. And I can basically carry a model of the entire game in, in my head as a game player, right? And so I can query my own knowledge of how the game will proceed. And I can query this emulation to decide what happens, right? So like I said before, 
is amounts to a lot of what if statements, right? If I took action A uh, while I'm in a certain state S, what is going to be the next state? And how much reward am I going to get at that, right? So you can think again as a, some type of uh, search, like if you take in AI again, uh, something like A star search, where I have a number of different uh, possibilities for actions going to the right or going to the left, which we're going to end up in uh, different states. So here are the actions on the edges and then the states um, in, in the screenshots. And then I need to plan ahead to find the optimal policy. So you know, even in something like a game playing like chess, Go, or even something even simpler like tic-tac-toe, we can have the idea of trying to plan ahead to find the optimal policy uh, by doing some type of uh, tree search as we're doing here.